This episode of Unqualified Opinions is brought to you by HireChain. Your next hire could come from anywhere, a recruiter, a job board, a referral network, or a conference. HireChain manages hundreds of candidate sources for you, so you only see relevant applications and can focus on picking the best person for your team. On average, our customers fill open roles faster and 30% cheaper than with traditional recruiters. Leading companies like The Graph and Masari already use HireChain. So get your time back. Talk to HireChain today and hire the best, fast. Visit HireChain.io slash Masari for prioritized onboarding. This podcast is meant for informational purposes only and is not meant to serve as investment advice. Hosts and guests may hold cryptocurrencies discussed in this episode. Opinions expressed may not reflect the opinions of Masari. Here's the reality. The intersection of AI and crypto faces a major uphill battle to achieve success. The idea of decentralized AI sounds great. Build the infrastructure of AI tooling in public and incentivize its coordination via tokens. But the reality is the crypto and AI ecosystem as a whole is competing directly against Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, Amazon, and others at every step of the AI value chain. The biggest tech companies in the world with their massive economies of skill, centralized coordination, and essentially unlimited resources for recruiting and compute have a huge head start. But not all is lost. I see three key structural advantages at how decentralized AI is being built I give it an edge over the larger centralized players. And here we give some insights into where I expect the most development in crypto and AI to happen in the near future. I'm Seth Bloomberg, and here's the story. Masari's annual conference mainnet returns this fall, September 30th through October 2nd. Now in its fourth year, Mainnet is the largest annual crypto event in New York, featuring leaders from crypto, Wall Street, and Washington. Join 3,000 attendees this year to hear from leaders like Kathy Wood, Hester Purse, and Chris Dixon talk about what's in store for this year, 2025, and beyond. We'll cover the explosion of real-world assets on-chain, the industry's physical infrastructure, the codependent relationship with crypto and AI, the continued growth of smart contract platforms, acceleration of institutional products, We've got it all. Main net your opportunity to meet hundreds of projects shaping the future of crypto and the institutional investors and capital allocators helping fuel their development. You can enjoy a 20% discount using discount code MasariPod when registering at mainnet.events. Interested in a prominent presence at this year's Mainnet? Snag a meeting room or a booth and contact events at masari.io to explore all Mainnet has to offer. Hey, Seth. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Marcia. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm actually really excited about this one. Um, it's uh, it's obviously a topic that has gotten a lot of attention and a topic that uh, I know you've been looking at for about a year or so, uh, very close to your heart. Can you talk to me? A bit about your journey for this report, right? Because yeah, you you originally set out with the idea to write like a big like landscape piece, and uh, yeah, you 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 ended up in a slightly different place. But I I do know that you put in a lot of work uh, in terms of s- to survey the entire space that got you to this point. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I mean. We kind of point this out in the piece too, but Masari in general has been covering this sector for quite some time now. We, we've covered it quite well, I think. Um, so what I think what we wanted to do, just to kind of like um, go into this piece, I think what we wanted to do was sort of like you said, like kind of take a refreshed view, like look at the whole landscape, see what's going on. And that was somewhat the impetus for it. And then as we you know as you're kind of looking and covering the space first of all it is like these two separate technologies and obviously we're quite you know well covered on the crypto side but it does take you know you you have to keep up with ai developments and those are just as frequent as you know crypto developments there's new papers coming out every day um and and lots of stuff to keep up with so there's kind of this groundwork you have to do to, to sort of catch up 
Um, and then there's stuff that you have to look out for every day. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work there. And then, you know, kind of once you have a good grasp on both of these things, then you can start to take a look at the, the landscape, if you will, to see what's interesting. So, you know, AI crypto, it's a, you know, it's a whole separate vertical stack. There's, there's all these different components. And so what we, what we kind of ended up doing was instead of going through each sort of layer, each component and describing, you know, the projects there, the value prop, um, and going about it that way, we tried to sort of take a step back and look at it from a couple, a couple different angles. Um, one of those is, you know, how in the grant, like looking at the full stack, um, how can these two technologies accelerate one or the other, right? So like, how can a crypto network help AI development occur? And then on the opposite side, how can AI systems contribute to bootstrapping up crypto networks or just generating on-chain activity in general? Um, so I think those were like two of the guiding questions um, that we kind of used throughout this research. And yeah, we tried to try to make that quite explicit in the piece as well. So I think that that's kind of the journey, um, you know, that we took to to get to the end product. And you know, you you kind of hint at it here a little bit already. But what what is what does it mean, right? Uh, the intersection of, uh, of of crypto and AI, right? Mm. And um, yeah. and why why does that intersection matter, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it also leads into like maybe like looking at decentralized AI versus centralized AI. So um, good good segue there. But, but yeah, what what is this intersection? Well, like I said, it is these two technologies that are you know quite uh, maybe on the surface quite disparate. Um, and you know, I think the classic kind of like line here is that like AI is this very abundant thing, right? It's it's you know, you can type in a prompt and you can generate a thousand responses, right? And, and then do it a thousand more times. Um, so, so AI, especially like this, you know, this newer stuff, this generative AI is sort of all about abundance. Um, and so on the other side is crypto, which is kind of about scarcity and, um, you know, applications of that. So you kind of have these two opposing, um, almost philosophies there or properties. And then you have these two technologies that are, you know, very likely on these exponential curves of growth. And so you start to, you start to look at these coming together. And I, I think that's the interesting way to look at these things is, okay, how can AI, like what, what are the gaps maybe in the market? What's missing there that crypto networks are uniquely positioned to help um, accelerate or kind of help bring out and then at the same time, you know, AI has all these, all these different properties. So if we start to think about how these things are going to manifest on chain, um, what, what's that going to look like and how does it accelerate either applications or how does it put to use some of the infrastructure, um, that, you know, frankly, desperately needs some, uh, some activity built on top of it. And as you as you say in a report, like centralized AI has one up here on on decentralized AI, but all is not lost, right? And uh, so you identified a couple of areas that you see as particularly promising, like right now. And uh, so so I would like to uh, to zoom in on these uh, a bit. So and and let's start with the decentralized compute, right? It's it's something uh, that is relatively easy. To understand, you know, deep in has obviously been a popular uh, theme, but there's also, you know, a lot of noise, right? And it seems like people have have almost been jumping in blindly to, you know, all of all of these these protocols that have emerged. What are people missing here that is important to pay attention to? Yeah, yeah, and so it's a good question as well. Um, and you, so you're talking about like these GPU networks, which, you know, if you think about the AI crypto stack, this sort of sits at the bottom, right? This is like the infrastructure, the core infrastructure that everything else sort of sits on top of. Um, and just like many other areas of crypto, this is probably the most mature from just, you know, being brought to market, 
and developed. And from a crypto token perspective, you know, some of the most liquid tokens sit at this area as well. So um, yeah, I think the market is kind of, you know, gotten used to these things. So just kind of like zooming in on, on these layer uh, on this particular layer. Um, I think one of the hardest things for the GPU networks to do is differentiate themselves, right? So the, the kind of value prop relative to centralized, you know, sort of competitors, if you will, is that oftentimes a decentralized marketplace is going to have a cheaper price point because, you know, there's less of a middleman. Um, they're, they're basically a smaller take rate that these protocols charge, which is obviously a good value proposition. Um, but, but maybe not one that's super important right now, um, the price perspective, because a lot of this technology that's coming to market is like zero to one. It's like, I couldn't have done, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, beforehand. So price isn't necessarily like the biggest thing to compete on and whenever the market is structured that way. Um, but in any case, I do think it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a struggle for many of these teams to differentiate. So one of the other ways to do that has been to just like try to gather more GPUs, um, which is like what these ML and AI systems are hungry for, um, whether that's for training or putting them into production um, with applications. And that's, that's also a struggle um, because these are generally, you know, in, in high demand. Uh, these GPUs. So it's kind of like all these different networks vying for the same resources. Um, and at the same time, you, you don't want to just have idle supply sitting on these decentralized networks. You need to also generate demand um, so that folks see the value of integrating with these kind of newer tech stacks that is like a blockchain and like accepting crypto payments or stuff like that. There's, there is some friction to overcome. So I think there's been somewhat of a struggle with that. Um, so as we kind of like, we're, we're looking at this this layer of the stack what we found is you know some of the more compelling use cases could be around looking at the architecture of ml models and thinking about how those are going to work with these distributed decentralized compute networks so i think one of the best examples to date has been uh, prime intellect which is um, right now you know kind of functioning as like a gpu aggregator so you can you can kind of go on the, on their side, it's on demand. You can select like the, the highest powered NVIDIA GPUs that are out there and you can kind of fine tune a model against that. And um, what's interesting is is their, their, their recent research, which looked into how to train a model whenever you don't have all your GPUs kind of co-located into the same area, right? So that's traditionally how you train these, these big models is you have all these GPUs that are networked together with this proprietary networking technology. It's not like just, you know, over the internet talking to each other, it's very specific and powerful. Um, and there's a ton of data getting passed back and forth. So you want these things physically located together um, and networked as tightly as possible. So now, whenever you have these decentralized GPU networks, the whole point is to just aggregate GPUs from wherever you can get them, whether it's in the USA or a different country or different geography. So training has historically not been a strong suit of these networks because of those properties of needing these GPUs to be co-located. And what Prime Intellect has done is worked with um, or you know, extended on the research that Google DeepMind, their, their AI lab has done, which showed, okay, if you have these distributed GPU networks, here are some methods that you can actually train a model on and have it be just as performant as a similar model with like the same compute budget, basically. Um, but you communicate, you know, 125 times less than what you normally would communicate in the centralized kind of traditional um, training setup. So um, I think that's really interesting because it is like taking advantage of the decentralized distributed nature of these networks. Um, and it's also just, you know, good, you know, pure, sort of like academic research on, okay, how do we, how do we really start to apply uh, different techniques and, and uh, training methods and maybe eventually like different model architectures um, that work well with these distributed networks that folks in the centralized world aren't even really thinking about yet. Um, yeah, so I, I think that was, that was something really interesting and I expect that to be, you know, a piece of research that others extend upon. There, there are definitely limitations in there um, but it is, I kind of think of it as like a springboard 
for others to to use and work on. Yeah, super, uh, super, super interesting. Um, another area that you touch upon are coordination platforms. Um, BitTensor pioneered this, and um, as you uh, as you noted in a report that you authored together with Sammy and Dustin post Denver is that BitTensor appears, or at least at that point in time, right, appeared misunderstood. Could you explain that again and, you know, including what problem it's solving? Yeah, for sure. So BitTensor, it's, it's like one of those things you could, you could probably make it as complicated or simple as you want it to be. And so I tried to really simplify it in the, in the report. And I, I just think of it, um, and this is something I think too that Sammy and Dustin have both talked about as well, but I see BitTensor as kind of this ecosystem of, of different networks and the core value, you know, the core value prop that BitTensor has with, with regard to all these different networks is the incentives that come from its native Tau token. So, so that's, that's kind of how I view it as like this incentive as a service, if you will. Um, and, and the way it kind of works, just like for, for some details there, you know, if you're, in, if you're interested in a specific application of ML or AI systems, so I think a good example is a very recent subnet um, or ecosystem that just popped up on BitTensor, which is trying to develop models that are very good at detecting either AI generated images or like AI altered images um, or like deep fakes. So that kind of area, right? So very, you know, kind of specific application with a wide, wide use case. Um, so the way this works is that a subnet on BitTensor gets spun up by a subnet owner and they kind of dictate what they want folks to be doing in this particular subnet. So the miners, I always think of them as like, you know, the, the kind of like ML researchers or the engineers, the folks that really know the, the infrastructure side and the, the ML side of things. So they run the models that are trying to, you know, be very performant against the specific application use case. And then there's this other set of folks called the validators who kind of like test the miners out, if you will, and, and grade them and say how their performance is. So, so that's kind of the overall structure there. Um, and then on the BitTensor side, again, the Tal token, that's the native token of BitTensor, it, um, there's, there's a few different ways to look at it, but effectively it gets emitted out to each of these subnets. And you know, a portion of it goes to the miners who are doing the work, a portion of it goes to the validators, and a portion goes to the subnet owner. Um, so you can kind of think of this as like providing incentives to do this work on BitTensor or BitTensor subsidizing the work, if you will, um, that these teams are doing. Uh, but I think that's a good example of, of you know, using BitTensor to produce like a very specific AI model in the space. Yeah, and 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 what you uh, I, I think what you said in the report, right? It's like all these centralized uh, AI labs. They have like very specific mandates, right? But uh, because they're like companies, like centralized companies, they also go about it in a very structured way, right? And and so where parties like BitTensor help, they allow for experimentation because there is no strict mandates, while at the same time providing like that coordination mechanism that it's inherently embedded in a centralized company. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, these like a centralized company, although the models that they produce, especially the frontier models that they produce are very good, it does take them a long time kind of like in in between releases if you will and i think that's like a specific area of, of crypto that can you know kind of like help this ai acceleration happen and that's like through these coordination platforms like you're saying is um instead of having this very centralized top-down mandate that might take six to 12 to 18 months to produce you can kind of like almost like have this horizontal scaling approach where you have all these little sandboxes that are all doing different um you know, all, all having different tasks and um, different applications that can be built on top of them. And you can just iterate quickly, you know, quickly through um, 
you know, whether it's the applications that you're wanting to like push these models into, um, or, you know, if you just want to spin up a new subnet because there's something that new that you want to try out, that's kind of like what, uh, you know, it's a very good substrate BitTensor is in, in these types of systems. It's a good substrate, um, to experiment with, with ML, which is largely, I think like where the space is still at. Like, like I said at the beginning, there's all these new papers that come out every single day on everything from different architectures of models to different ways of using data um, and, and, you know, the different types of data that can be used in these systems. There's just so much that still needs to be explored. And I, I think that's like a big value proposition that something like a BitTensor has. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, switch gears here. Um, AI agents, also like uh, a term that has been thrown around a lot. But um, what is what is an AI agent really? And you know where where's the opportunity here? Yeah, I think there's a couple different areas of opportunity that both hit that, that hit on um, both how AI can accelerate crypto and how crypto networks can accelerate AI. But as far as AI agents go, I think you know, kind of like you're saying, like it's there's still maybe not like a super consensus agreement on this yet, but an AI agent, I think you can just think of it as like a general piece of software. And that piece of software, you know, can connect to different models. Um, so you can think of like GPT models and other uh, models from different labs. It can, it can leverage those to complete some task that it needs to complete. And that could be a simple task, um, like summarizing an article, or it could be something complicated and sophisticated, like understanding, you know, conversation that you're having with multiple people and then like going out and booking, you know, your travel for the, for the next month based on you know, what, what you've been talking about, um, with, you know, with people. So, um, so yeah, I think it's that, that's kind of how I view AI agents, just, you know, piece of software that can you know, leverage generative AI to complete task. Um, so kind of like starting maybe with how, um, crypto networks can accelerate AI in this regard. I think, I think one of the, like, you know, maybe almost well understood points, uh, here is AI agents, you know, the saying is like, they, they won't be able to open bank accounts. They can't have a bank account. Um, they just don't work well with legacy financial infrastructure. Uh, and crypto rails just make a ton of sense then as an alternative for this, right? It's anybody can spin up a wallet um, on any of these open networks. They have the choice of what, which type of wallet. There's different ownership structures that you can set with these things. So it allows these, you know, so if, you, if you're wanting to like, you know, pay an agent to like, um, you know, book your travel or, you know, summarize this PDF or whatever it is. Um, it's very, you know, if they, if they are using crypto rails, it's very easy for you to send them USDC and, and they can accept that payment. Um, whereas it just doesn't work as well with traditional finance, uh, and the rails that they have. So I think that's one interesting area. Um, and then maybe the other is, you know, kind of the opposite there where AI can help, you know, bootstrap activity on chain. So we talk about this in the piece a little bit, um, but there's two protocols that I sort of called out. One is Wayfinder, which is still not quite live yet, um, has a white paper and they, they kind of publish these demos every once in a while. And then the other one is, is Autonomous or Olas, which is, is live in production. So I'll, I'll just talk through Wayfinder maybe a bit. Um, so whenever you're thinking of like interacting on chain with an application or wanting to do something, as a, as a human user, there's a ton of points of friction that you can run into. And that's, you know, everything from having the right wallet for the right network, having the right token, making sure you have the right gas token, you have enough of it, uh, making sure you're interacting with, you know, the wrong contract or something malicious. There's just a ton of ways that, you know, you could churn out of using someone's product that they built. And so things like Wayfinder have started to say, okay, maybe Maybe instead of like having the user needing to figure all this out, make sure they operate safely, maybe we can put, you know, this kind of AI agent system in front of them and they interface with that. And then on the back end, this AI agent can kind of carry out whatever needs to be done to complete the task at hand. 
And so I think that's pretty interesting um, from the human user perspective. It just reduces like the, the points of friction, probably the rate of churn. Um, so that's that's a net benefit. And then on the back end, I think is whenever the interesting stuff really starts to happen because now it's up to this agent to figure out, okay, this guy wants me to like bridge this new network, do this token swap, you know, all this other stuff. Like how, how do I actually do this? So what Wayfinder is developing is it's kind of like this graph structure that these agents can traverse and, and that's how they would operate or, you know, act on a user's behalf. So you can think of it as like, you know, if you just drop this agent onto like an open network, like a blockchain, it doesn't know what to do. It's kind of like almost blind or it's like just looking in the dark and like feeling around and hoping it's doing the right thing. And then Wayfinder's approach is to say, okay, let's, let's kind of like brighten up this space with these paths that um, determine, you know, how to, to do something on chain. So you could think of it as like a bridge would be something that, you know, would be used quite heavily. Um, and that would be like something that, that would have a lot of value. So if you're, if you are a bridge protocol, or if you've built a bridge, you could kind of push that code into Wayfinder and stake their token against it. And that kind of gives you some skin in the game. And then that agent and every other agent that's kind of on the Wayfinder platform can start to use that, that bridge protocol, um, to carry out actions for users. So, once you start to scale this up, then you kind of like have almost like, you know, if you think of like a city design from like, you know, the top down view, there's all these paths and grids that are marked out and everyone just kind of knows how to get from A to B um, because it's, it's you know, basically well documented, if you will. So that's a really interesting protocol, um, really interesting design. I think it scales well. There's, there's lots of um, details to, to get into there. Um, yeah, so so that's that's an interesting one. There. Uh, yeah, so it almost it almost to me it almost feels like it's it almost feels like a Web three browser, right? That that could potentially massively increase like the user experience as well, right? If I think about chain abstraction, for example, which is quite a a hot topic. You know, I don't know. This is something that definitely makes me exciting, excited from that perspective, as it could, you know, potentially help yeah. onboard new users as well. I think that's a good way to look at it. Like, I, you know, I don't want to maybe push it too far, but it is sort of like, you know, before there were browsers or like indexing services like Google, you just kind of had to know where to go um, on the internet to interact with things. Um, and that's obviously not ideal, but once these indexing services come along, that just changes the whole, you know, that, that sets off a new industry. Um, uh, so I, I kind of see it that way too. I, I think it is almost like indexing, um, you know, the on-chain world, which is always changing. It's always dynamic, just like the internet and we can publish anything to it. So these services are hugely valuable. So maybe uh, maybe maybe one last question then with respect to this, right? It, I imagine that what is super important then for a protocol like Wayfinder is like how they go to market, right? Yeah, I think that's that's a big uh, piece of it. Um, so we'll we'll see, you know, how how they eventually do this. Um, but as far as you know, some of the stuff that they have showcased. Um, kind of on the demand side is, you know, a nice um, UI for users to interact with. And I think in the beginning, it'll be simple. Um, you know, there's just going to be kind of like a, uh, an agent that's built into the protocol that ever, you know, most everyone's going to use. Um, and it'll be able to do like very basic, but like core actions, like on-chain actions that you will like bridges and, and swapping and lending and borrowing and those sorts of things. Um, but I think over time, you know, the way I can see this working is, you know, you're encouraged on the, again, like on the demand side almost to, to either like pick different models, maybe that have different profiles associated with them. Or even if you're like a model developer, maybe there's some kind of incentive for you to, to work and upload a model um, into Wayfinder as well that, that can help. And then on the supply side, there's, there's also other interesting things kind of, you know, from a go to market perspective. Um, the, the team's kind of said they're going to build out paths 
and kind of seed those paths to the graph network to begin with. So there's like some, you know, and they, uh, usefulness to the thing once it hits production. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, um, I, I'm sure there'll be some, you know, uh, some kind of subsidy maybe at the beginning to, to have more people kind of throw in their paths and stake against the code that they have. But I think there, there's this nice flywheel that could be generated um, by more code getting added, agents are more useful, it's easier to interact with these things, so more demand hap, you know, occurs on the platform. Developers see this, want to tap into it as a means of distribution, and you kind of hit this flywheel. Okay, well, thanks. Um, very, um, yeah, very interesting, exciting stuff. Um, maybe one last question. Um, What's your next report uh, in this area going to be about? That is a great question. Um, so I think we're still looking at a few different things. Um, but one area that I didn't, um, maybe I want to explore like a little bit more deeply or more zoomed in on is this notion of the power of like smaller models working together. So I kind of like talked through this a little bit with AI agents and how they complete tasks. But I think sort of like tying it back to the, the coordination platforms, um, you know, these smaller models that are maybe like a, a bit more use case specific or a bit more niche, um, they're, they work better on distributed networks that you need to train them or fine tune them. Um, but whenever you start to stitch them together, or maybe like you have an on-chain marketplace where you can like buy these services or like do some kind of orchestration on top of these things, that can become very powerful. Um, so there's a lot of talk about, I think, like AGI and, and things like that right now, where it's just like the single, almost like big brain uh, model that's doing everything. And maybe that comes um, at some point. And I think, you know, in the near future, it is going to be a lot of these smaller models that work together. So thinking about like what the marketplace looks for that, how they're stitched together, why they would want to use on-chain, um, you know, the, the properties of, of on-chain um, systems to, to, to build these marketplaces. I think all that's very interesting. So that, that's probably where I'll be exploring in the next report. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I can't wait, uh, for the, for the next one. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing the pod uh, with us today. That was very interesting. This episode was produced by Steve Bickemer based on the report, Dissecting the Intersection of AI and Crypto, written for the Masari Enterprise by me in August, 2024. To learn more about BitTensor, Wayfinder, and the intersection of crypto and AI, please consider subscribing to Masari Pro at masari.io.